Thanks, everyone. Um, uh, for those of you who uh, don't know Ijin Wang, Ijin Wang is an associate professor in, in our department. He's got a background in uh, biomedical engineering and runs a lab over in one of the research buildings. Uh, and he's going to give a talk today on uh, stem cells and their surgical application. So, Dr. Dr. Wong. Thank you, Dr. Mao. Good morning, everyone. So I want to make sure you... Is it working okay? Okay. So, so we're, we're going to switch gears. Like every time, as uh, Dr. Mel mentioned, I'm a PhD bioengineer. Every time I give grand rounds, I feel I have to give some uh, uh, introduction about myself. And because I'm not an MD, I'm a PhD. Uh, I'm co-directing the Surgical Bioengineering Laboratory just next door, so uh, with Dr. Dana Farmer, so she's not here today, but uh, we, so I'm also, so I have, because I'm, I have a background in biomedical engineering, bioengineering, so I have a secondary appointment with the biomedical engineering on the main campus. Uh, so the surgical bioengineer laboratory, uh, which is just next door, I'm gonna, today's presentation will be primarily focused on the research updates on what we're having uh, right now ongoing in the lab and also as a uh, new Dean's Fellow in Entrepreneurship. So I'm going to give you a short update on what's going on with our campus in medical entrepreneurship and also what we can do potentially uh, for our medical research and how to translate that into the, the uh, clinical applications. So I have two primary uh, goals today. Number one, is the, that I'm gonna give a brief introduction of our research uh, and updates on the projects we have on the on the lab side, especially now that we have a new batch of uh, residents and and uh, members to the department. So I figure that's actually quite important because as an educational component at the academic institution. I mean, all the basic research or translational research that we're doing in the lab uh, actually can help our future disease treatments or patient care. And we have lots of active project practice ongoing. So I'm very excited to tell you a little bit more in, the, in a little bit. So my second part is about the entrepreneurship and medical innovation and invention and entre entrepreneurship activities that we have on this campus, especially with the uh, Eggy Square, which I believe I will talk a little bit about that in a little bit. I believe most of you have heard about it. Uh, it's m one of the most exciting projects in the uh, UC Davis community. So, first of all, I want to give a a, a uh, overarching uh, introduction about the research in the uh, Surgical Bioengineering Laboratory uh, next door. So, the the overall goal is to bring bioengineering, biomedical engineering to surgery. That's what we do. So we're trying to actually get uh, stem cells and stem cell derived products that can be applied to different surgical applications. And meanwhile, we are also interested in medical devices, which from a cellular level, actually extracellular vesicles, extracellular uh, matrices, they're very important in maintaining and supporting cell functions. So we can actually make extracellular environments or extra, extracellular components overall into a medical device related uh, uh, project. So we are, generally speaking, we are uh, bringing both stem cell bio biology, stem cell engineering, and also biomedical engineering or medical device engineering into the regenerative medicine uh, field and for surgical applications. So we can really do a lot of things for almost all specialties in our department, so that's what I'm trying to, to convince you in the, in the next, next couple of slides. So over the years, actually, I joined UC Davis 2012. Actually, time does fly, fly quickly. So over the years, actually, the research focus has been evolving, and but the, the focus is maintains the same, which is a regenerative medicine. And if you think about your body and or any defects or diseases you are treating, so the the body is made of stem cells, or cells actually, cells, or progenitor cells that can differentiate into cells. 
So cells and extracellular components. Extracellular components, so especially extracellular matrix, they're very important uh, molecules that can uh, guide the behavior of cell, cell migration uh, or differentiation. And on the other side, actually cells, they also communicate with, with each other by secretion. So a lot of cases, they are, they are communicating with each other by direct contact or by indirect, indirect contact, but with the secreted proteins, pro molecules, or vesicles. So recently, actually, the stem cell field has been really focused on a, a lot of the extracellular vesicles, which are the nanoparticles that can be secreted by the stem cells or can be secreted by any cells. But specifically by stem cells, those secreted particles can mediate very important uh, uh, either regenerative signals or, or disease-related signals. So by doing a stem cell research or de developing a stem cell product or stem cell-derived extracellular vesicles, so you, can, you can actually have a product that can be injectable. So you can do IV, you can do any intrathecal injection, by doing stem cells or extracellular matrix, extracellular matrix based medical devices, you can actually make a device that can be implantable. So which means in the open surgery situation or other situations where a medical device is required. So you can incorporate some biological signals into the traditional medical devices to make the medical device more active or uh, efficacious. So by bringing all these components together into surgery, we're hoping to develop some novel treatments or different treatments or, or some uh, strategies that, uh, that can be used to treat some diseases or defects that are not treatable before. So we're doing a lot of animal studies. So today I'm going to focus a little bit more on these uh, stem cells, extracellular vesicles, and extracellular uh, matrices that we, can, we have developed in the lab, more from a uh, uh, introductory uh, level. So as I mentioned, almost all the divisions or the subspecialties in our department uh, can benefit from uh, biomedical, research, biomedical engineering research or bioengineering research or generally speaking. So for example, birth defects or uh, genetic diseases or uh, fetal diseases, which we are doing a lot of research on in our department. So biome biomedical engineering uh, stem cells can definitely benefit that. Uh, field and also trauma injury. So any trauma induced injury or body response. Uh, so we can actually use biomedical engineering or stem cells based uh, approaches to tackle and uh, vascular diseases, including cardiovascular diseases or peripheral artery diseases uh, or brain wound or diabetic ischemic wound. So all these, uh, you know, bi biomedical engineering approaches can actually promote vascularization or uh, healing process. So we have projects on, in plastic surgery, of course, because we can get a lot of stem cells from different uh, to be discarded tissues, and uh, we can use those stem cells for different applications, actually. So in, in uh, overall, the biomedical engineering research, I mean, we can find more uh, applications in almost like uh, all you, if you think about your specialty, and if you have any ideas or any questions, I'm very open to discussion. I think uh, potentially we can really find, find uh, projects, innovative projects or, or innovation or invention driven research projects, so using biomedical engineering. So overall, I think, I mean, we are focused on innovative research in stem cells and stem cell engineering and also medical device development. So over the years, actually, uh, I have filed uh, eight patents. So these are all, uh, as you can see, some of them more focused on uh, stem cells, some of them are more focused on medical devices, but all of them are uh, focused on uh, uh, regenerative medicine or surgical applications of uh, medical technologies. So we also have actually many ongoing research projects and with funding support. Uh, so actually we have I have obtained like 24 small, big ones, uh, grants from uh, intramural or extramural uh, agencies and over $30 million of research money actually has come into Department of Surgery over the past several years. So to highlight a few, so we have two ongoing NIH grants, one R1, one R3, looking at stem cells and biomedical engineering approaches to, to regenerate uh, 
birth defects uh, regenerate the defects in a spina bifida situation. Uh, we also, Dr. Farmer and I, are co-PIs on two CERM grants. One actually was recently started uh, in January 2019. is a Clean One grant. And the other one actually was the uh, one before this Clean One project. It's basically at the Preclinical Development Award. So the focus of this study is really to de de develop a stem cell product. I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, later uh, for, for our clinical, potential clinical use in the near future. We also have quite a few ongoing research grants with the Shriners uh, Hospitals uh, for Children. So especially this one actually, early in the year, 2019, January, we started a clinical trial with English Bulldogs with, uh, born with spina bifida. So it's a, so it's a clinical trial with collaboration with the vet school. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit later about that as well. And also quite a few other biomedical engineering and a ligand technology-based uh, research grants ongoing with close collaboration with uh, doc, uh, Dr. Asa Panich uh, from biomedical engineering. So, I mean, this one is, uh, is I wanna highlight this one a little bit because this is the biomedical engineering focus uh, project is ongoing right now. So it's a vascular graft project that we have been running uh, over the years. So it's a medical device. So basically we're trying to use stem cell technology and to combine uh, a ligand that can be uh, used to uh, recruit endothelial cells to form endothelialization uh, uh, quickly before the thrombosis can happen uh, for artificial blood vessel grafts. So with the hope to increase the uh, patency and increase endothelialization. I'm going to talk to you about the science in a little bit, uh, focus on this project. So very briefly about the stem cells, what we have been doing the, over the years. So we've been actually de deriving, the focus of the lab of stem cell research is really on uh, stem cell products or stem cells, uh, uh, engineering stem cells that can be used for uh, clinical applications. So we are currently doing GMP production of uh, uh, placenta-derived mesenchymal stem cells. We're also very interested in stem cell biology or stem cell secretion uh, and based on the different methods that we can use to expand stem cells and also to how to deliver stem cells for different diseases and how to promote the cell survival after transplantation. So on this line, actually, we're also very interested in how to engineer the stem cells to make sure they are more uh, functional they can survive better and they can, we can also make some artificial stem cells that can have certain stem cell functions, but they won't be killed because they are artificial. They, are, they, they, don't, they don't have a life to start with. So this actually is something we have actively going on, having uh, ongoing in the lab right now. So overall, we're developing stem cells that can be applied into different applications. Um, so placenta-derived stem cells, particularly in the past couple of years, have been our uh, research focus, of course, we're deriving a lot of cells from placenta because the placenta, usually they are discarded uh, at, when the baby is born. Uh, so we can de derive different type of stem cells from placenta, especially mesenchymal stem cells. And you can also derive different uh, stem cells from different gestational stages as well. So this is one uh, representative research project that we're having for spina bifida using the stem cell products with the, in combination with the fetal surgery. Uh, so we actually were seeing a very consistent and very significant improvement in motor function after the treatment of uh, the, uh, for the fetal uh, surgery treatment of the spina bifida situation with stem cells. Actually, the treated, stem cell treated at lambs were able to uh, stand up and walk. So I believe most of you have heard about this research. I'm gonna just very briefly mention that. So based on this uh, research, actually, we, we have two grants. So this is a new grant that started early this year to really to develop a uh, GMP, good manufacturing practice based uh, grade stem cells that can be applied into clinical trials in the near future. So we are doing actively doing good manufacturing practice uh, uh, grade stem cell generation right now, and we are actually coming to the end of uh, the cell production. So with, uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks, actually, we're gonna ramp uh, up with the cell uh, banking. So we're gonna have quite a few very active cell banks that we can use for human clinical use in the near future. 
So we're also very interested in uh, the collaboration be between the med school and the vet school by using the natural occurring disease models for diseases. So for example, we actually, we, we're, we have identified, uh, so English Bulldogs, as I mentioned earlier, they actually develop birth defects, especially spina bifida, in a very similar way to human being. And the defects can be actually treated by the stem cell product that we're developing in the lab. And we're running a clinical trial right now, actually, as you can see in this picture, that the English Bulldogs with the newborn English Bulldogs actually de they develop uh, paralysis, very similar to human uh, newborn, newborn baby. And if you don't do anything or if nothing is offered to these puppies, you already nothing is really standard uh, operation or uh, procedure for cure or treatment yet. So they are usually paralyzed and many of them actually are euthanized. So if they're rescued, they can have a, a wheelchair, they can move around just like human patients. So we're identifying that by uh, MRI, actually you can see the opening of the defect of the spine. It's very similar into, uh, between the English Bulldogs and human uh, patients. So the stem cell part actually is really, I mean, everybody in the lab is, is culturing stem cells and we're actively looking at the stem cell biology or stem cell functions. And we published a lot of papers about placenta MSCs in, in the uh, in vitro different models for, for tissue regeneration applications. We also actually been recently focused a lot on the secretion of uh, placenta MSCs or MSCs in general. The reason being, uh, as you may know, you know, the functions of the transplanted stem cells or the functional mechanisms could primarily be either uh, uh, having the cells to differentiate or engraft into the transplantation site, or on the second uh, half possibility is that the cells are not engrafting, rather they are secreting. So they're regulating the environment, they're gonna be there for a short period of time, but during the period of time they're there, they're gonna modulate the environment, they're gonna go away later on. So either one of these two pathways actually stem cell applications for different diseases, you have seen some benefits of uh, having the cells there. So actually for mesenchymal stem cells, generally speaking, after transplantation, and this is what, what we have found in our lab too, after transplantation, within a pretty short period of time, they go away. So what, no matter what you do, they actually they stay there for a sh very limited time period of time. So how, how are we really seeing the benefits of these transplanted cells if they don't stay there for a long time? So actually, we, one of the major hypotheses we're having right now is that the cells are secreting a lot of important factors, including all those nanovascles. We call them extracellular vesicles. So they're packaging their packages of materials inside that can be actually delivered from one cell to another, and they can they can stay there for a long time, and they can uh, they can transfer information from one cell to another and from the transplanted cells to the to the uh, host cells overall. So we have been actually, so this is, a, this is the most recent publication we have in the lab. Uh, so we found that placenta MSCs are placenta mesenchymal stroma cells, uh, uh, or PMSCs we call them. So they, they can protect neurons. So we have designed a vitro co-culture system, which is a, a by uh, transwell. So we have one population of cells cultured in the inner uh, insert, and the second population of the cells is cultured in the well. So they are not directly contacting with each other, but they're communicating through this paracrine secretion through the media. So we're finding that actually by having placenta mesenchymal stem cells, when neurons are in apoptosis, and if you're adding placenta MSCs on the transwell, so they can actually rescue neurons from apoptosis. So, and without being like directly uh, contacting the neurons, they can just uh, function through the paracrine secretion. And we actually have been focused on the derivation of the nanoparticles, the extracellular vesicles that we can derive from placenta MSCs lately. And we found that actually in the nanovesicles that we can derive from MSCs, they contain a lot of very important uh, biologically active materials, including RNAs, a lot of RNAs, and proteins. And these, these are nano tracking analysis assays that we can characterize the size of the nanoparticles, they're actually only 130, each, 100 to 150 nanometer in size. So they're nanoparticles, you don't really see them in culture if you don't, if you don't look for them very particularly. 
So, but they are wrong. So the cells, any cell type actually in culture or in transplantation or anywhere, they actually can secrete different extra, extra cellular vesicles. So this is one of the research focus that we have. Many of our lab members are interested in developing uh, stem cell derived exosomes because if stem cells don't stay there any lo long anyways, why don't you just uh, derive some stem cell product that can be applied and uh, into different applications, di different patients. So we actually found that the placenta MSC derived extracellular vesicles, they are neuroprotective too, which means in the neuroprotection assays, you don't have to use pl placenta MSCs. You can just use the uh, extra extracellular vesicles you derive from the culture. So eventually you can use this as a cell-free therapy for different diseases. So stem cell functions can be uh, mediated by these EVs, so you don't have to use stem cells. So currently the lab actually is focused on deriving or uh, EVs or extracellular vesicles from stem cells, especially MSCs, and we're also interested in how to increase the yield, how to increase the, the delivery method of the, using these uh, vesicles for different diseases, and we're also interested in engineering of these particles to make them more targeting or more uh, efficacious for different diseases. And we're also making artificial EVs. So by learning all these rules that uh, stem cell EVs can do, actually we can make them bottom up. So you can use synthetic biology strategies to make a very standardized product that can be applied into different uh, applications, uh, disease treatments that stem cells can do. So this is just an example how we can make the at nanovascos with different ligand modification. So these can be used as an injectable material. So you can inject them into IV, into any, uh, using very minimally invasive approaches. Or you can develop uh, exosomes in, or EVs into a scaffold that's uh, uh, transplantable. So you can deliver those uh, EVs in, into any open surgery situations to modulate the environment or to regenerate. So we're having both strategies ongoing actually and on the research side in the lab. So I'm not gonna go too deep in that, but I think I'm hoping next time I'm gonna give you a talk on EVs only, like without using stem cells, but using stem cell derived EVs, what we can do, what diseases we can treat, what, uh, so lots of different diseases are in research right, right now. So the second part of the, uh, the lab actually is uh, really on the uh, extracellular matrix or extra, extracellular matrices overall. So we actually are interested in deriving, deriving native ECM from decellularizing, decellularizing different tissues. And we, we can also, also functionalize ECMs by using lichens or using, for example, SIS, small intestinal cell mucosa. It's widely used in, in our department for different specialties. And we can actually uh, further improve the function of those uh, products. We're also making artificial ECMs uh, by engineering, so by uh, all these engineering uh, approaches, making nano uh, fibrous scaffolds or hydrogels that can be injectable or transplantable, and also functionalize how to in introduce all those uh, uh, cell type specific functions into the ECM products or medical devices per se. So to inc incorporate a cell type specific functions. So I'm gonna just take a couple minutes to introduce you about the medical device research that we have in the lab focus on cell, uh, cell matrix interaction. So as you all know, cells, especially uh, all those like cells are making the solid organ the tissues, they need to have the binding sites, right? They need to have the matrix to interact with, to survive and to function. So one of the key molecules that play a very important role in the process is called uh, integrins. There are many, many integrins for uh, cells and cells are in, when they are in different stages, they're having different integrin expression on the surface. And when they have different integrin expression on the surface, actually they're gonna interact with different extracellular environments or they're gonna do different things uh, in response to the extracellular uh, components. So we have been interested in uh, deriving materials or ligands or molecules that can be uh, used to modulate cell behavior, cell migration and attachment especially. So by using a one bead, one compound uh, technology that developed by Dr. Kit Lam on campus here for biochemistry, we're collaborating using the one bead, one compound, one B, one C technology to derive the ligands that can be used to guide stem cell functions. So 
I mean, Dr. Lam has been uh, very successfully using this technology for cancer, but actually we're using a similar strategy by uh, screening the library to identify ligands that can be used for stem cells. So, for example, the stem cell, we have the bead, so it's about uh, 100, 100 uh, uh, so it's much bigger than cells, so 100 microns, and you can identify some bees which ha have some specific ligands on the surface that have a better or stronger binding to specific type of stem cells. So we have been interested in mesenchymal stem cells, we've been interested in endothelial progenitor cells so far. So we have identified quite a few very important ligands. So one of them is called LXW7. It's a, a molecule that very specifically interact with the integrin alpha V beta 3 on the cell surface. So as you all know, endothelial cells or endothelial progenitor cells are playing a very important role in regeneration and vascularization. So actually, when they are in active format, they highly express alpha V beta 3 on the surface. So by using this technology, actually, you can increase endothelial progenitor cells or endothelial cells uh, binding and also proliferation. As you can see here, with the ligand modification on the surface, endothelial cells actually the uh, binding attachment is significantly improved. So, which indicates that you can use this ligand to increase uh, endothelial cell behavior, right, by, by improving the cell attachment. And you can also see that X sub 7, this ligand can increase cell proliferation, so which is also very important. So if you have some endothelial cells on the surface that are attached, and they can sense, sense the signal, they can proliferate and make more. So make the vascularization or endothelialization more active. So more important, actually, we're, we've been really focused on the uh, VEGF recept receptor phosphorylation pathway. So as you all know that VEGF uh, is very important in maintaining vascularization and tissue re regeneration. So by using VEGF locally to the defects or injury site, actually, you can increase vascularization. However, it ha it is a, the, life, the half lifetime is very short, and it, it's not very stable, and also, using high dose doesn't really uh, help. They can cause tumor formation. So by using this ligand, actually, you don't need to use a high, or you don't need to have a very high uh, uh, levels of uh, VEGF in the environment. So even low level of VEGF can sense, um, the stems, the endothelial cells can sense it and can respond to the, to the molecules. So we published this paper uh, using this 1B1C for endothelial cells, and now actually, we found that the ligand can be used to modify medical devices, so biomaterials or any material surface, generally speaking. We have x 7 on an artificial ECM surface. You can see here, actually, you can really see, but you can see a lot of the, the cell spreading and much spreading more attachment compared with untreated artificial ECM surfaces. And actually, by Having this technology, so potentially you can imagine many things can do. You can do a lot of different things. It can be used for different applications. For example, you can use that for vascular regeneration of uh, nophilium, right? When and vascular grafts are implanted, you don't usually the problem comes with uh, the, the lack of a nophilium. So, so you could potentially have the ligand on the luminal surface that the circul circulating endothelial cells can be re re recruited to the surface of vas vascular grafts. Also, for ischemic wounds, for example, diabetic ischemic wounds, where the, the vascularization is very limited, you may be able to use the ligand to increase the endothelial cell functions and to increase, if you are transplanting stems, uh, endothelial cells, you can actually have the endothelial cells survive better or proliferate better. So also for burn, for vascularization uh, of a deep burn, so it could be very beneficial for those patients too. So, I'm going to focus on this one because this has been an ongoing project in the lab for, for the past like, several years. And we actually have these two models ongoing right now, so I'm hoping next time I can focus a little bit on that. So this is the vascular graph project. As you, you know, the small diameter of vascular graph in coronary artery replacement or uh, bypass, actually is the, high, the failure rate is very high, so that's why it's very hard to do. And also, in general speaking, all vascular graphs I mean, it has a lot of problems associated with the uh, cell proliferation, or the lack of endothelium actually can cause different problems. For example, thrombosis, or platelet binding, or other cascades of uh, uh, unwanted uh, cell over proliferation. 
So we have made some small diameter vessel graph, and we, we use the rodent model to evaluate the uh, vascular regeneration. So by using this ligand to modify the surface of the very small graph, which diameter is only one millimeter, it's very tiny, it's tiny, tiny. So, uh, so we have used this graph in the rat, rat carotid artery as a model, bypass model. So this is a science uh, hypothesis. As you all know, uh, in circulation, there are endothelial cell, endothelial progenitor cells and many other stem cells in the circulation. When the body is injured or in the danger situation, actually the bone marrow is making more endothelial progenitor cells. So by having this ligand on the luminal surface, actually you can potentially you can capture the uh, endothelial progenitor cells from circulation, which can usually will be wasted. So they, if they don't have the binding site, they're gonna just keep passing around. But if they have the binding sites, actually the endothelial progenitor cells from circulation could have a better binding uh, surface they could form endothelium. So we actually implanted this into the rat cardiac artery bypass model. We found that X double seven treatment actually significantly increased the uh, the patency. So this is the number of patent grafts. So over the like six weeks time point, uh, and so you can see that with the modification, actually the graph is uh, so five out of six is patent through the six weeks. Rather, in the other control group, actually only one graph stayed open over the time. So for the, for the uh, endothelialization of the luminal surface, actually you can see there is, this is the luminal surface of the graft. You can see there is a little bit of endothelium there, right there. So in, from a closer clo uh, look at the luminal surface, actually you can see the proximal end of the graft, middle of the graft, and the distal end of the graft. You can see the control untreated group, especially the middle of the graft, when you have the coding, you have a lot more cells. And these cells are CD34 positive, which is a uh, endothelial progenitor cell marker. And over time, actually, you can see this six weeks time point, the middle of the treated graph, have, they, they have a lot of endothelial uh, cell coverage on the surface already. And that's actually why the graph stay open. And for the control groups, actually, you have limited endothelial cells from the beginning, and they don't have very many cells in the middle of the graph. And the rodents, actually, they have a higher, they, they can uh, endothelialize the graph pretty quickly. So actually, that's why it's not the same as humans. So that's why we actually have moved this into the large animal facility or, and using the pig model. Uh, and we're trying to see if what we can do in the rodent model uh, what we see that, can we see that in the pig model? So this is a relatively new project with a lot of help from uh, our surgical residents, uh, Jonathan and Katie in the audience today and have another slide for the whole team. So what we have seen so far actually, well, it, this is a bigger project actually. Compared with doing rats, the pig surgery is quite different. Uh, but actually, this is one pair of the graph that come, the, that come from the same pig. So on the cardiac artery interposition model, so we have one graph on the one side and the other graph treated, so one untreated, one, untreated, uh, one treated with the ligand on the other side. Actually, you can see some difference between these two graphs from the same individual. So this is the, the bare PTFE surface. You can see actually, well, you can see more clearly from here. So there are some clots in the, even though both of them were patent at the time of uh, six weeks post uh, implantation. For this pig particularly, we have done quite a few others. But I think there's a pretty steep learning curve for the surgery and many manipulations of the vessels and grafts. Uh, so, but for this pig actually, you can see a lot of clots and platelets binding to the, to the PTFE graft without coding. But on the coded graph, actually, you can see a better, so we, we better cellularization and coverage of the endothelium on the surface throughout the length of the graphs. So we did immunohistochemistry of the luminal surface of the graphs. As you can see, actually, we use a, a, a endothelial cell marker, uh, one Villebrand factor, VWF. You can see a lot more endothelial cells on the surface of the treated graphs. So more studies are ongoing to confirm what's going on with that, and we need to implant a lot more pigs too to get a conclusion. But I think the preliminary data is very promising that we're getting some um, more endothelialization on the luminous surface of the graph that could potentially help the short-term or probably also long-term patency of these uh, graphs. 
So I think uh, next time I will probably have the whole data set that I can present to you and see exactly how the ligand is working in the large animal facility, uh, large animal model before we uh, translate this into human applications. So I will spend the last about 10 minutes probably on how our UC Davis medical uh, entrepreneurship is ongoing right now. So as a new, uh, well, not that new anymore, the Dean's Fellow in Entrepreneurship. So the Dean's Office actually uh, last year uh, uh, started a Dean's Fellow program uh, focused on three areas, entrepreneurship, informatics, and precision medicine. So I'm the, uh, the entrepreneurship fellow. We actually have a, a yearly symp uh, symposium about a month ago, I think probably some of you have been were there, so we actually so for my project actually for my fellowship in entrepreneurship, so I have quite a few things I wanted to accomplish. But for this presentation today, I want to focus on two aspects that have been I've been working on. I think it will be beneficial for especially for the new resident to know about the the research we have in the lab and how we can actually translate them into into commercialization or ap clinical application. So I, I've been trying hard to establish the surgical bioengineering lab, not just my own lab, but also as a hub for innovation education for everybody, for everybody who's interested in uh, innovation and, and uh, commercialization, physicians and faculty, residents, scholars. And so we have lots of students and scholars in the lab, medical school students, graduate, graduate school students. So the, the focus is really to, fo to foster uh, future innovation. So this just a starting point. We're hoping the lab can the lab can serve as a hub for everybody who's interested in research, and it's just next door. So if you want to stop by any time, just let me know. So the lab is very well equipped right now. Actually, we can do a lot of engineering things. We have lots of equipment that can be used for for engineering, uh, the different equipments for nanofiber scaffolds, for axism engineering, nanoparticle preparation. Uh, we can. We have lots of cell culture room. This actually particularly is a GMP cell culture room. It's pretty locked well. So, um, but we actually have a regular cell culture room, quite a few who's in the lab as well. So you can, if you want to do some any cell culture related research or individual eventual models of research, you're more than welcome to let me know. Uh, we have also the small animal surgery suites. We have two of them. Uh, so we can, we have the equipment that can, can be used to make different animal models. So particularly for this one, actually, is a vascular graft implant implantation in the rats. So you can do that under the scope, and two surgeons can do surgery at the same time. And this is a large animal facility on the Davis campus that we have been using for years and often. So over the years, actually, we have been very uh, successful in developing animal models for human diseases, different models and different species actually from rodents, from uh, mouse, rat, to uh, guinea pigs. Uh, we now have well, lots of sheep, we have dogs. You know, we, we have every species almost. Uh, and with the surgical uh, skills from all the residents and faculty members who are involved in the research, actually we're really uh, doing, so we're collaborating with a lot of uh, other investigators who are interested in uh, animal models too. So the second part I want to highlight a little bit is the really the co collaborative research environment in the lab. And we're really trying to integrate varying uh, disciplines, especially the vet school. As you all know, the UC Davis vet school is actually number one in the world. Um, and also they are very interested in regenerative medicine overall. So we can co collaborate with them uh, with different animal models, uh, especially the natural occurring disease models in the small patient uh, clinic. And also, we are very actively coll collaborating with the biomedical engineering or engineering school of engineering overall. So I think engineering can help uh, all specialties in our department. And we're providing uh, uh, lots of uh, opportunities for the, vet, uh, for the uh, biomedical engineering students to this campus and also the other way around. We're trying to expose our residents and fellows and fa faculty who are interested in collaborating with engineers to the main campus. So we have lots of connections and we have quite a few different projects ongoing right now. So we're also working very closely with the work, veterinary 
uh, Institute for Regenerative Cures. So it's another version of uh, Inst IRC, so Institute for Re Regenerative Cures on this campus. So the vet school has another work there doing some uh, uh, animal clinical trial right now, as I mentioned before. So the idea really is to combine the vet school and biomedical engineering into our medical, human medical research and to improve the product development and clinical uh, trial uh, uh, of different technologies. So the last thing I want to mention really, by doing this Dean's Fellow, so with the help from the Dean's Office and uh, Dr. Jim Kovacs especially from the uh, Aggie Square's uh, uh, innovation uh, office. So we actually are doing research. We are also emphasizing on innovation and invention. So educating anybody who is interested in making a product or having some idea that can come from your clinical practice or come from the lab into a uh, IP, so intellectual property. How to do that and how to translate the IP into commercialization. So, well, with the Aggie Square ongoing, actually, there is really significant opportunity around here. And so I'm going to just very briefly introduce the Aggie Square thing. Uh, so actually, well, as you know, Aggie Square is a really one of the biggest projects ongoing right now at UC Davis. And our Chancellor May, actually, who came from uh, Georgia Tech, so who was a part of the, the uh, Tech Square at Georgia. So, at, so last year, actually, I was part of the team we visited uh, Georgia Tech's, uh, the, the facility over there with the uh, UC Davis, uh, Bob Seeger is the, the uh, leader of the team and also they are from UC OP, uh, Office of, uh, of the President. We visited uh, Tech Square, as you can see, the Tech Square 2001 and 15 years later, actually this is about 15, 2015, the picture I can find online. So it's very different. I mean, the community has completely been uh, transformed by this tech square idea, actually. And that so many uh, high tech industries around this area and the whole, the whole, I mean, all, everybody, the residents, they, I mean, who are, who are living there are very proud of being part of the tech square. So we're hoping UC Davis Aggie Square will have similar impact or a similar uh, uh, in thing in the, in about like ten years from now, or if not uh, shorter, sooner. So actually, the latest news about Aggie Square is about a month ago, June eleventh. So the request for qualification is published. I mean, it's uh, open now. This really the so this is what you can see in the next couple of years. So this is the that's a Stockton Boulevard. All right, this is the Aggie Ag Square where it's gonna be. And the next one you can see. So this is a hospital zone. This is where we're at right now. So this is phase one at Aggie Square is ongoing right here. So with this ongoing, I mean, lots of parties are involved and it's very exciting and especially for medical innovation and entrepreneurship actually. So if you have some idea that you wanna do a startup companies and make a, your, your own uh, products or devices, you know, this is a good time. And it's also, it's not just every square, I think it's the whole community will be reformed and will be transformed. So apparently the impact will be huge, will not just be to UC Davis, but also to, to the entire community over here and also maybe to many other places. Okay, I'm gonna conclude here. So, I mean, I'm hoping they, I have convinced you that Surgical Bioengineering Lab is actually pretty busy with different projects and we're having uh, so different uh, collaborations between the, the, our med school and the vet school and also biomedical engineering. And we're exploring uh, opportunities for, for collaborations, more active collaborations for research and for product development. We're also very excited about education. So if any of you, especially the new residents who are interested in research, so please come by and I will show you around what we have. So with that, I would really thank to all the team members that we have ongoing. I just updated this last night. Actually, we have uh, quite a few new residents who joined our lab uh, this summer. And this is the mini symposium that we had a couple days ago, weeks ago. Uh, so with our collaborators, uh, some biomedical engineer faculty like Randy Carney and a few others and some MD PhD students actually. So I want to specifically thank a few other collaborators, Jan Ota and Gerhard Bauer from our stem cell program who are really 
helping us to move the stem cell products into clinical trials in the near future. We're making the GMP grid cells right now. From the vet school, we have uh, Dory Borgeson and uh, Bev Sturgis, uh, so who are really helping us translating our stem cells into a vet school clinical trial already, which is ongoing. I can give you a more report on that project next time. So this actually collaboration is very uh, beneficial for our human uh, stem cell product development for, because the FDA actually now can see in the natural occurring disease model what the stem cells are really doing and efficacy and safety as well. So with the Jim Kovach, actually the officer of the Aggie Square Innovation Officer. So he's really my, really my mentor in the, the academic and entrepreneurship. We've been working on several projects together and get to know a lot of people in the entrepreneurship side. So uh, Kit Lam is my main collaborator for the ligand work, and Alisa Panich and Stephen George from Biomedical Engineering. They've been really helping a lot with our collaborative projects, research, and also education. So special thanks to our Vesugraph bioengineering team that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Lin and, uh, and Kaylee uh, Yamashiro sitting in the uh, audience today, and also our postdoc, Dr. Howe, who is actually leading the science part of the project, and Chris Pavetti who's our SRA and leading. This is the whole team of uh, the, the pig barn, uh, and they, the surgery speed. And thank you very much for your time. I will take any questions. Right? Okay. Any questions? Yes, sir. Sure. And, uh, what's, yes. what's your next recipe? Yeah. So we actually, we, I only presented integrin alpha V beta 3 targeting ligand. So I think this is a very good one. It's very specific, very strong. We actually have quite a few other ligands in the lab. We're, we submitted one uh, manuscript already on another ligand. It's called uh, alpha 4 beta 1 integrin. It's very highly expressed in uh, hemipodic stem cells and also uh, immune cells when they are activated, T cells. For example, if they're activated, they're going to highly express integrin alpha 4 beta 1. And uh, so we, are, we have found a few ligands that was Dr. Lam's lab support. And they, his lab actually has been focused on alpha 4 beta 1 for cancer for a long time. So we have some candidates. And for stem cells, for, so mesenchymal stem cells, for example, they don't express alpha V beta 3. Endothelial cells do, but MSCs don't. But they highly express alpha 4 beta 1 integrin, especially when they are in activated states. So potentially we can use that for MSC research or MSC transplantation, expansion, all those kind of things. We found in actually some very interesting uh, effects of uh, that ligand. Um, any need for growth factors? Yes, absolutely. So with the collaboration with the uh, Alisa Panish lab from Biomedical Engineering, we found a well, we're interested in VEGF overall. We're interested in VEGF because many reasons and. Um, you know, and <laughs> VEGF actually, we, we found some VEGF mimics. So it's a small molecules that can rep represent fun some functions of VEGF, but has much higher uh, long life. And uh, also, you don't have to go with that high concentration. And you can be mobilized to medical device, so that can be sustained release. Sustain local exactly, local effects and sustained release. Yeah. You don't have to like give um, multiple injections or high doses, those kind of things. Yeah, we'll be very cautious about this. And well, I think overall, we, we have used a lot of ligands. And th these two ligands I mentioned er uh, earlier, there are almost no toxicity to any cells that we have tested so far, very low. Uh, and also, we can actually conjugate by chemistry. We can conjugate the uh, ligand to the medical device surface, which will allow very low concentration for application. So the toxicity may, may now be a big issue, but we haven't really done a thorough FDA level uh, tax study yet, but I think that's on the to-do list if you want to move this really forward into clinical use. Thank you very much. Any question to the from the residents or anybody who is interested in the research? So, you can send me an email if you don't want to ask now. But. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.